Despite its comfortingly wholesome image, the story of LEGO is rife with chaos, uncertainty, and legal disputes. The globally renowned, multi-billion dollar company went through decades of setbacks in an attempt to stay afloat, making its history almost as fascinating as the toys themselves. So, today we're going to take a look at the history of LEGO. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other toys you would like to hear about. Okay, time to toy around with some weird history. In 1916, Ole Kirk Christensen purchased the workshop in Boulogne, Denmark, that would ultimately become the birthplace of Lego. At the time, Christensen was a carpenter who primarily built furniture and home goods, like ironing boards and ladders, for a living. Anyone who has ever tried to start a small business knows that it can be incredibly difficult, and for Christensen, it turned out to be especially hard. During just the first few years of his business, he faced a number of setbacks and tragedies. His workshop burned down in 1924 after his sons accidentally set fire to it. The Great Depression hit in 1929, and his wife unexpectedly passed away in 1932. So, not exactly what you'd call a lucky streak. To stay afloat, Christensen began crafting cheap wooden trinkets, eventually landing on a wheeled duck that became the company's first popular toy. Who knew the birds with wheels demographic was so lucrative? By 1934, Christensen's work attracted enough attention to warrant giving it a name, Lego, derived from the Danish phrase play gott, or play well. Incidentally, Lego also resembles a Latin phrase meaning I put together. And to Christensen, it felt like the perfect fit for his venture. The Great Depression of the 1930s affected the global economy and forced Christensen to lay off most of his employees. To stay afloat, he ramped up his wooden toy production alongside his home goods. Christensen managed to leverage the yo-yo fad of the mid-1930s to his advantage, but it was still hard to create a market for toys in the devastated economy. It's hard to sell a toy to a person who can barely afford food. Unless we're talking toy hamburgers or edible yo-yos. As he inched closer and closer to bankruptcy during the Depression, Christensen did what so many do in that situation. He turned to his family for financial help. His siblings agreed to bail him out, on the condition that he stop making toys and turn his skills to a more practical profession. That might sound like a familiar conversation, but Christensen refused, continuing to create innovative toys with unique moving parts. That'll teach him to bail him out. I guess. He began attracting a larger audience, particularly with copies of an original toy prototype he'd created for his sons, a wooden duck with a movable beak. Germany invaded Denmark in 1940, just a few years after Christensen's company officially became known as Lego. The German occupation of Denmark was more lenient than that of other countries. But when it comes to occupation by Nazi Germany, Leniency is a fairly relative concept. There was still economic and social consequences for the country's people, and like others in his homeland, Christensen struggled under the new regime. On top of that, his workshop burned to the ground for a second time in 1942. Never before had the cosmos aligned so powerfully against a humble Danish toy maker. Luckily, the Allies liberated the country three years later, but by then, resources were scarce and in high demand. After Denmark reversed a wartime ban on the commercial use of molded plastic, LEGO shifted its material emphasis from wood to plastics. Though plastic had become much more accessible by the end of the war, the tight post-war economy caused most governments to ban the use of plastic for manufacturing anything inessential, such as toys, until the late 1940s. Additionally, the machines used to create plastic were extremely expensive, but Christensen attacked the problem with the tenacity of a kid with a new LEGO set. Undeterred, Christensen rebuilt his burned out factory and proceeded to purchase a plastic injection machine and begin producing prototypes. These early toys included the Ferguson Tractor, a plastic vehicle available either as a finished model or a buildable set that could be taken apart and put back together. Huh, he could be onto something there. The company sold an estimated 100,000 units of the tractor between 1951 and 1954, marking the first time in the company's history its plastic products outsold wooden toys. Hey there, weird historians! Now you can live like your favorite royal finks from history with Kingdom Maker, the epic medieval MMORPG now free to play on iOS and Android. 
take control of a fledgling lord or lady and construct your kingdom from the ground up. Forge alliances or wage bloody war. However you choose to rule is up to you. Engage in competitive multiplayer and raid on other players' kingdoms. Or dive crown first into romance and intrigue as you form a unique story worthy of your very own weird history episode. And with a wealth of customization options, you can make your noble as attractive or as historically accurate as you want. Your armies are also fully customizable, so your infantry, cavalry, archers, and champions can ride into battle decked out in the finest threads and carry Carrying your unique war banners. Produce your own lineage of captains, merchants, explorers, diplomats, and rogues to carry on with your good name. Shrewd negotiations, strategic resource production, or good old fashioned assassinations. You can even sacrifice nobles to a volcano because ruling a kingdom means making tough but entertaining decisions. Use the link in the description below to download and begin building the kind of legend worthy of its own primetime series on premium cable. Thanks to Kingdom Maker for sponsoring this video. The very first items Christensen produced with his plastic injector were small cubic bricks which fit together in a locking grip. It wasn't a completely original idea. The businessman had been inspired by similar bricks he encountered at plastic molding showcases in the late 1940s. Originally patented in Britain in 1939, the bricks were created by Hilary Fisher Page and produced by his company, Kittycraft. Page's bricks featured four studs on top, which could be locked into other similar pieces. The Christiansons experimented with the design and ultimately came up with automated binding bricks, a predecessor to the modern Lego brick. Whether LEGO had permission to borrow Page's design or simply rip them off is a matter of debate. According to the LEGO group, Kittycraft permitted the use of the original design. According to people familiar with Page, he was never made aware of the LEGO brick before his death in 1957. Whatever the case, in 1981, the LEGO company formally bought the rights to Kittycraft bricks from Page's descendants for 45,000 pounds, the 2022 equivalent of roughly 160,000 pounds, or just over 200,000 American dollars. That's only slightly more than the price of a vintage LEGO pirate ship on eBay. That is a bargain by any reckoning. Christensen appointed his son, Gottfried, as junior manager in the early 1950s. The two had been working together since the mid-1930s, when Gottfried first came to work at the shop. Seeing the potential of the bricks, Gottfried conceived of a system of toys which could interlock and work together to make bigger, more exciting and complicated projects for children. In his own words, the LEGO system meant that all elements fit together, can be used in multiple ways, and can be built together. Gottfried Christensen had a vision in which Lego bricks bought years ago will fit perfectly with bricks bought in the future, so that a Lego element not only has instant value, but would keep its value always. To that end, he swore that the company will always make sure that all bricks, from yesterday, today, and tomorrow, fit together. Essentially, Gottfried's idea was to make the Marvel Cinematic Universe of building toys. In 1955, Lego released its first set, known as the Lego System of Play. After his father's death in 1958, Gottfried became the head of the company, and his plan for systemized toys became LEGO's new business model. That same year, the brick took a quantum leap forward thanks to the newly patented stud and tube design, resulting in a more stable construction and ushering in the age of the LEGO brick as today's fans know it. Though interlocking plastic bricks comprised much of the company's production by the end of the 1950s, they were also still producing wooden toys. After all, wooden toys got the Christiansen's feet in the door. You gotta dance with the person who brought you. By 1958, wooden products were marketed and sold with the brand name Bilofix, a division of Lego specializing in sets combining both wood and plastic. However, the wooden toy production facility was hit by another fire in 1960. Seriously? People running insurance scams don't even see their businesses burn down that often. This final blaze was started by a bolt of lightning. It truly seemed as though the universe did not want the Christiansons to continue making wooden toys. The company obliged and quickly switched entirely to plastics. This prompted two of Gottfried's brothers, Carl Georg and Gerhardt, who had previously led the wooden toys division, to leave the company, with Bilofix splintering off into its own independent operation. LEGO dominated the interlocking plastic brick market for several decades, but the last of its unique design patents expired in 1978, and competitors like Tyco Industries and Megablocks 
didn't waste any time producing their own plastic building bricks. Tyco Industries, later part of Mattel, legally challenged LEGO in the early 80s over their brick lock designs, offering an alternative to the United States. Tyco was successful in court, but its construction blocks never managed to connect in the commercial market. Get it? Connect? Because, you know, the blocks? Many patent disputes have played out in international courts, including several cases involving mega blocks throughout Europe in the 90s. In 2004 and 2005, England's best lock went up against LEGO ultimately leading to a German Supreme Court ruling that other companies can create pieces that fit with Lego bricks. Everyone wanted a piece of Lego, which makes sense, because pieces are easy to lose. After decades of runaway success, Lego reported its first significant loss in 1998, prompting layoffs for roughly 1,000 of its 10,000 employees. Lawsuits over trademarks and patents contributed to the drain on the bottom line along with increased competition from similar toys, the dominance of video games, and the brand's overextension into global theme parks, niche markets, niche markets, and original entertainment. In 1999, the company began licensing popular properties for the first time, beginning with Star Wars theme sets and Winnie the Pooh Duplos, Duplos being larger Lego bricks suitable for young children. Though the company continued to suffer profit losses in the years following, these licensing deals, along with successful LEGO-themed video games, eventually helped pull the company back into sustainability for over a decade. Yet this move was not without controversy among longtime fans of LEGO's uniquely creative approach to playtime. Tech correspondent Molly Wood spoke for a vocal contingent of parents in a 2013 opinion piece that argued, the licensed LEGO sets are basically the antithesis of the LEGO model. Wood pointed out that LEGO blocks she had in her youth encouraged children to learn how to build things, whereas the newer sets, simply require children to follow somewhere between 100 and 300 steps to build a very specific one-time-use vehicle or environment. After that, they're done and could move on to the next shiny branded toy. Technically, that's the problem shared by most toys. Once you buy them, they pretty much stay the same. He-Man is only ever going to be He-Man, unless you get the battle-damaged version, or the one that glows in the dark. Despite help from licensed products, LEGO continued to experience significant losses into the mid-2000s. A rapidly changing toy market, a series of misfired attempts at innovation, and design inefficiencies within the Danish company all contributed substantially to a reported loss of roughly $340 million in 2004. The executive vice president of marketing cited overzealous investing, changing interests among children, and rigidity in their business models for a near bankruptcy. The situation was so dire that Gottfried's son, Kjell Kirk Christensen, turned operations to Joran V. Knudstorp, the first non-family chief officer in the company's history. Yeah, I agree. Surprised the factory didn't suffer another mystery fire. This new leadership placed greater emphasis on outsourcing production and branching out merchandising opportunities, including producing several movies based on the toys, such as the 2014 surprise hit, The Lego Movie which grossed nearly a half a billion dollars worldwide. These new priorities gave the toy company the bottom line boost it needed. Now, fans are keeping their fingers crossed that LEGO can build on that success, one brick at a time. So what do you think? What was your favorite LEGO set? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.